everyone to the show. Today we've got Dr. Swathi. Doctor, how's it going? Good. How are you? Good. Doing great. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us. Really excited to have you on to talk about all the work that you're doing in the research aspect of cannabinoid medicine. So mm-hmm. what exciting stuff are you working on right now? Um, so we just actually wrapped up a project that I'm so excited about. And so we got to work with, we as in my supervisor and I, we got to work with two last year pharmacy students. They're in their fourth year finishing up. And so they have this great setup where they finished all their clinical rotations by the end of December of their last year. And then that last four months before graduation, they get to do a full on research project. They get to learn how to do an IRB and everything to have clinical participants or to have uh, like to do a survey, for example. Um, so we put together a survey that evaluated the, sa- the patient perceived safety and efficacy of CBD products. Um, so we got to talk to various customers that came into the store. We use social media as well um, through the store to um, try to get as many participants as possible. And so we just had quite a few calls, submitted the poster and everything. Um, and it's just, it's it's very exciting what we found. And so I think one of the, the main things that I definitely wanted to mention that we found was, um, so we found that only 6.3% of the patients that we surveyed actually talked to their practitioner or talked to their pharmacist about CBD. Um, and so that's just so important that that's a part of the conversation. And that's something that I'm trying to promote is practitioners being knowledgeable about cannabis, about CBD, and being able to have that conversation, even if the the patient is perhaps interested, but because of the stigma or because of some sort of reason that they don't want to bring it up or they think they're going to be perceived in some sort of way. Um, if the practitioner, if the pharmacist knows how to bring it up or has those tips and tricks, then then that's something that, yeah, that, that I think would be very helpful for patients. Now, what in your research and with the, the practitioners, what have you mm-hmm. found that CBD has been used for the most? Ooh, um, probably pain, pain, okay. Um, okay. followed by sleep and anxiety in a tie. Yeah. Mm-hmm. In a tie, huh? Yes. <laughs> but, but those are the top three, though. Those are the okay. Three. So when yeah. you say sleep, is that used to help sleep, to stay asleep? Uh, what What exactly are you talking about? All of the above. Okay. Um, a lot of the people, um, actually, yeah, all of the above, either falling asleep or staying asleep. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. And what do you? What have you seen the most of? Is it most people that have trouble falling asleep, or is it mostly mm-hmm. staying asleep? Ooh, I'm not sure. I can. I don't know if there's one that really outweighs the other. A lot of people just say, like, I can't fall asleep or I can't stay asleep. Hmm. No, there's nothing in particular, actually. Um, I, I guess it's all rolled into mm-hmm. one, you know, because if they can't sleep or they can't yeah. go to sleep, it's still sleep, right? You can't sleep. That, yeah, that that's sucks. pretty much it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> With everything that you've been working on besides the sleep mm-hmm. and anxiety, have you found that CBD or the cannabis side helps the most with the sleep? Um, so when it comes to the using CBD for it, I think a lot of the time it's associated with like their mind won't stop racing. And so I think CBD in that aspect would be great for like, if they have some sort of anxiety that's keeping them up. So that would be that side. But then the other side is like a lot of the research that is out there is THC for sleep. Um, so right now, like if, if I'm in the pharmacy, for example, I'm not going to recommend a product that, um, has any sort of THC or rather has more than 0.3% of THC because that's not what we have in the store. Um, the most that we have are like the isolate broad spectrum or full spectrum. Um, but in general, if someone were to ask me that question, like on a podcast or like if someone were to email me and ask me that, then I would probably suggest something that did have a bit more THC in it. Okay. Mm-hmm. And so whenever somebody can come into your store, mm-hmm. um, you guys are working mostly with hemp right now. The cannabis is in the research, correct? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So mm-hmm. with that, with, with the direction of cannabis research, and I applaud you tremendously for all the work you guys are doing, because if we didn't have the research, we wouldn't know how to use it, right? So exactly. you guys are doing it. Mm-hmm. You, you're doing great. And keep up the good work, mm-hmm. by the way. With all the research that you guys are doing, and as you know, mm-hmm. cannabis uh, and the hemp movement has progressed along the years... Mm-hmm. Have you received a lot of pushback from the pharmacy community? 
Yes, definitely. A lot of my colleagues don't really understand what I do. Um, it comes with quite a bit of judgment. I think it, it's mainly just because we're not taught that in school. Like we're not taught about cannabis, cannabinoid medicine, the endocannabinoid system. We're not taught about like natural medicines in general and that concept of like integrative health with conventional pharmacotherapy. So that prescription medication, like plus other modalities that can help and looking at it from that like multifaceted, multimodality approach, which is not something that I think we talk about enough in school. And so I think that's probably why, um, that's probably where that judgment comes from. But I mean, overall, I think more and more people are becoming more and more familiar with cannabis and with CBD. And I definitely see a trend I like within students, students contacting me and asking me questions, students wanting to learn more. Um, and then also pharmacists trying to figure out like how they can get more training and how they can learn more. In the last uh, like 48 hours, I had two pharmacists contact me asking for like a, an educational program or something that I would recommend that would be great for pharmacists because there are all types of programs out there. They're great. Great ones actually um but there are there isn't really one like for a pharmacist specifically yet that i know, yeah. of, that I know. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what you're involved in right now the residency yeah. with the mm -hmm. can you tell us a little bit more about that about the residency sure yeah, so the residency, um, so my supervisor and, and I, so my residency program director and I, um, we met about a year ago and I was doing a clinical rotation out here with her. Um, and we both just realized that we had that same passion for trying to bring integrative health into more of a like public lens in terms of with students, with practitioners. And we kept getting a lot of questions from different practitioners and students and caregivers and patients about integrative health, about cannabis and so we decided to put together the first ever postgraduate year one postdoctoral training program for pharmacists in integrated medicine and cannabis um, so that's what I've been specialized in training in since so how hard was that to get that implemented um, because we were the two that decided that we were going to do it we were going to commit to it um, I think that like with a lot of help from like networking and a lot of like great advice given to us from various people like within academia, I think I think we really pulled it off overall. But yeah, I mean, it didn't come without its obstacles. <laughs> right. Yeah. So speaking of obstacles, um, mm -hmm. they say you can't teach an old dog new tricks. So <laughs> the older generation of pharmacists and, and doctors mm -hmm. you know, might want to jump onto this because it's a, a new remedy that they can offer mm -hmm. their students. Yeah. Have you seen more of a um a taking of it or a liking to it from the younger generations or the older generations hmm that's a good question actually no one's actually asked me to define that um i would say that i see it from both sides it's maybe a little bit more percentage in the new generation um just simply because of probably the media and what we're exposed to and everything and they probably have a lot more people like in that recreational space that have talked about it or they've tried it or something um so they can see the potential like that therapeutic potential in it um but i do see a lot more of the other like pharmacists in the older generation the older practitioners that are also looking to it because they keep getting questions right and a lot of them want to be able to answer that for their patients and provide like that next level of care um so i think just even from that perspective, them getting the questions, they want to be able to answer them, whether or not they are like actively seeking the information before getting the questions. And I think, I mean, it kind of goes hand in hand with the older, like the baby boomers and the older generation, you know, mm -hmm. they, as you get older, the more pain you have, right? And they yeah. probably don't want to be prescribing mm -hmm. opioid after opioid or pain medication after pain medication. So, I mean, it's uh, another tool in their toolkit. Yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> exactly. And that's like why I'm so passionate about integrative health, because integrative health is all like the modalities together, cannabis being one of them, cannabis being a great one, but cannabis <laughs> being one of them. Um, and so, yeah, I think that the more people learn about the different ways to heal, the different opportunities to heal, the different like methodologies to heal, I think the better we all will be, really. So from a medical standpoint, um, a, a lot of recreational is geared towards this, the smoking, edibles. Right. Uh, and mm -hmm. stuff like that. The medical side, what type of consumption are you guys focusing on? Um, I would say it's pretty varied depending on the ailment, depending on the patient's preference, um, depending on what other medications are on. Like cannabis is so personalized for patient to patient. Um, so I wouldn't say like that 
we recommend the same thing for everyone. Um, but that being said, like tinctures are great though, because you can titrate them up. Like you can add a little bit more slowly um, to see if the patient benefits from like a little bit more rather than than like a capsule that only comes in a five milligram or like an edible that only comes in that certain amount of milligram as well. So um, in terms of like starting from zero and going up or especially for patients who haven't tried cannabis before, the cannabinoid naive patients, uh -huh. um, I think they really benefit from tinctures and okay. being able to start at 2.5 milligrams even, like starting very low and then going from there. Really? So mm -hmm. the, that small of a dose is uh, you guys have been working with something like that? Because I was watching an interview you mm -hmm. did a couple months ago, and mm -hmm. you mentioned that you guys were doing three, there were, there were I think there was 300 or 500 milligram studies. <laughs> so, I mean, we're not doing those studies, but this, a lot of the studies that have been published, uh -huh. um, they looked into doses that high. Um, and I, I probably the one that you're referring to is um, I brought that up because a lot of people ask me about drug interactions and like what they should be worried about. And a lot of the studies that have been done, they are with like those high, high doses of 300, 500, like really, really high, even higher than that too. Um, those type of doses. And so, yes, they see more opportunity for drug interactions. They see more opportunity for side effects than like the average person taking cannabis. So I think that that's like where that comes from. Um, but it, it is so personalized and like patient specific. There are some patients who do amazing on 2.5. Really? Right? That's, yeah. That's I mean, very surprising. Some, and then there's some that like need upwards of 50, you know, you name it, like higher than that. So it, right. it just depends. Yeah. And depends on because the ailment. Because it's, because mm -hmm, it's not, it depends on the ailment, but it's also like the way that it's metabolized in the body is like, it's not like any other medication that you would think of, like that's prescription in that. Um, normally if you give more, there's like a dose dependent relationship. So if you give more, there's a higher chance of side effects or like a patient is prescribed a certain dose for a certain reason. But with cannabis, it's not like the dosing isn't, and the dosing and the efficacy isn't related to how much the person weighs, how old they are, um, and like a bunch of other factors that we would take into account with prescription medications. Interesting. Mm -hmm. That's very, I'm just blown away by the two, the <laughs> two point five milligrams. I mean, it's possible. Some right. people only really right. need that much. I mean, I know people who take two point five CBD. Like one of the the women that I know that um, one of my colleagues, she takes that, and that's like enough for her. <laughs> it, that's great, you know, because yeah. it, like you said, it is so individualized, you know. Because mm -hmm. some, I used to have a retail shop uh, that sold CBD and hemp products, um, mm -hmm. and so the patient or the customers would come in. And it's really hard to recommend something because A, I'm not a doctor. Yeah. B, there's mm -hmm. not enough research out there. And it was open for right. about, like the last three years. And so mm -hmm. they're, like you guys are really kind of on the forefront with all of that. And more and more is coming on as the mm -hmm. legalization progresses. And so yeah. is there something, say to all, to all the listeners out there today, mm -hmm. and they're looking for one product, you know, say you said a tincture, because I'm a big believer in the tincture. It's the most yeah. mm -hmm. medically uh, feasible uh, you know, avenue for new patients or new customers to come in to use CBD or cannabis. Mm -hmm. Is there a recommendation? You know, I always told them to start small, you know, start mm -hmm. with a three, start with a 300 because the dose I think was like 10 or 13 milligrams. And mm -hmm. so start with half and then double it or, you know, kind right. of bracket that. What would you recommend to, to new customers or new patients? Yeah, the start low and go slow is completely true. So I mean, starting as low as 2.5 or five, I think is fine depending the person and then according to that then they can go up from there um but i do think that having a practitioner on board is so important like some sort of like specialist that's gone out of their way to put in that effort to learn more about cannabis to learn more about the endocannabinoid system and to really help like tailor that program and that treatment regimen to the person um so they might also recommend something very low to start with um but they'll be able to track that progress and also see like maybe if like that's even the right option for them or maybe like a certain strain or a certain ratio is so much better for them versus something else and I mean a lot of cannabis therapy is trial and error of course but um, I think having the practitioner on board is really important um, some dispensaries are doing that though there are quite a few um, that have like state mandated programs on the northeast like in the northeast like I know New York is one of the states definitely that um, they require a pharmacist to be like 
um, they require the pharmacist to be in a dispensary. Um, really? Before, yeah. Mm-hmm. It's, it's a pretty amazing model, in my opinion, that um, it's required. And so if the patient has any questions, they can go to a pharmacist that um, has had a little bit of extra training in right. cannabis rather than just um, someone else who's there who has, like, anecdotal experience or something like tender. that. Yeah. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> yeah, because I mean, there's the whenever it first started, you know, they say indica for sleep and sativa for dayquil or whatever, you know, mm-hmm. just that 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 duality of, you know, black and white, you know, but th- right. we, we're finding out that that's not true. And so well, and also with the, the hybridization of all the strains, too, right. we, I mean, like even distinguishing the two, I don't know at this point. And, and you're exactly like, there's so many strains coming out daily because, you know, new yeah. breeders, you know, mm-hmm. their programs crossing this, crossing that, just getting different terpene profiles. I think so exactly. with, with that being said, how do you see the medical community kind of going forward to standardization of a, you know, a medicine for people? Yeah, I mean, standardization is going to be really tough. I mean, especially right now with like the regulations. I mean, even regulations in terms of what's legal or what's not legal or what's accessible or what's allowed in each state is so different. So I think standardization is going to be really tough because even beyond that, again, like when we're thinking about like as a Western practitioner, when we're thinking about it, like we're used to medications that are like one compound that react with like one receptor. And so it's very easy to, mon- not very easy, but it's a lot easier to monitor that one compound rather than the plant itself or the strain that might have like so many different terpenes and different cannabinoids, major and minor. And there, it's just so much more complex. Right. Um, so I think standardizing it is going to be really, really difficult. But I mean, if I can think of standardization in a different perspective, then like if we standardize like the education that can go for practitioners or students or both, then I think that that would be the best. Cause if we start with them, then they can teach the patients and the caregivers. Mm -hmm. So as the patients, you know, start to become more aware of the customers across the country, Mm -hmm. some regions of the country are more um, lenient on the hemp and the cannabis uh, mindset, you know, Mm -hmm. and regimen. What would you say to the people that don't have access to a practitioner mm-hmm. like yourself in the South, in the Midwest, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. as opposed to, like you said, major metropolitan areas in the uh, New England area or the West mm-hmm. Coast? Yeah, um, there are great practitioners that are doing a lot of telemedicine, I mean, particularly in the COVID era right now. Um, but also even before that, I have quite a few practitioner friends that have clients and have patients all over the world, and they're just working remotely, and they're able to do the telemedicine with video. Some people only do with phone call, um, and they're able to do those like really, really lengthy con- consultations where they don't have any sort of time frame. Like if you were to go into like a private practice or a hospital where the practitioner has only a certain amount of time where they can see a patient. Whereas um, if you do telemedicine like that, they're able to spend an extensive amount of time, ask all the questions that are necessary before adding cannabis to someone's regimen. Um, So those are some opportunities. Um, And then on top of that, there are some really great companies that do ship all over to all the different um, all the different states, like different CBD and hemp brands that do uh-huh. um, that do that, that could be a great option too. Because otherwise, it's so it's so hard. Right, there's so much out there. You can find and anything on Google. Pa- patient, it's like, what do I believe? What do I not believe? Yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. And then you know they're only going to look for one thing, but then that I guess the mainstream mindset would be. Mm-hmm. unless they've been using, you know, medicines for, for a long period of time, you know, how is it going to interact with my body? How is it going to interact with mm-hmm. other medications that I am taking, et cetera? And that's where a specialist yeah. comes in. That's where Dr. Exactly. Swati comes in. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that, I mean, yes, definitely. That's where a specialist comes in. But also, I mean, that's like all of that research and stuff is still very much ongoing too. So like as practitioners learn, then they can disseminate that to their their patients so i mean like it's it's a great field to be in because i feel like i get to learn something new like every day or like three things a day (laughs) that's awesome (laughs) yeah (laughs) so we know that cbd can be used for a lot of things i mean there's a Mm -hmm. laundry list of things that it can be used for anecdotally Mm -hmm. yeah a lot of people don't want to ask the hard question what is it bad for like how Mm -hmm. how is cbd thc cannabis what are the bad things that people don't know about Mm mm-hmm it's a great question. I mean, as of now, we know that no one has like overdosed from it. 
Um, the the entire conversation around dependence and addiction is very, very complicated and controversial as well. But like, what is bad about it? I mean, we don't know anything about like, as far as we know, there's no toxic dose or something like that, that we need to worry about when it comes to either of the major cannabinoids. So I mean, toxic dose, I guess, if you consider like THC, someone getting too high or something right. like that, then they have that like intoxicating or euphoric effect rather than calling it psychoactive. But um, what about like drug interactions and mm -hmm. uh, I guess people that can be allergic to it and stuff like that, you know, mm -hmm. like allergies. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Yeah, I don't know a lot about the hypersensitivity, like the allergic reaction. I haven't. I haven't really heard much about that, to be honest. But um, when it comes to drug interactions, there are a few, like clobazam, which is like a very rarely prescribed anticonvulsant, so a uh, seizure medication. Um, so that is definitely a medication that we do not want patients taking that as well as um, as well as cannabis. But I mean, it, it really depends. So the when it comes to the metabolism of THC and CBD, they're metabolized by the same enzyme system. Um, but within the enzyme system, they're both metabolized by two different enzymes. One of them is the same. So one of them, they have that overlap. But then the other two that primarily metabolize it are different. And a lot of medications that are on the market right now are also metabolized by those same enzymes. And so that's where we start to worry if they're taking like a certain medication that's also metabolized by CYP3A4 is the most popular one. Um, and then they're also taking cannabis. Like that is something that where a practitioner is so important to be able to look into that and see if that is something to worry about. Again, because so much of the research has been done on super high doses, I mean, we're like most practitioners are inclined to say, okay, maybe separate it by a few hours. Um, but it is something that practitioners should know about, but also we shouldn't be scaring our patients or anything right. about that. Mm -hmm. So with the research being done in such high doses, mm -hmm. is that because they can just kind of bracket it out to say, you know, instead of 300, do 150. And so, you know, it's kind of a, a gauge, if you will. Why did they pick um, 300? I mean, I, I don't know uh, why they, picked those doses to be completely honest i think it was a little more arbitrary um but <laughs> honestly but, um, but, but i i don't really know and i don't think they know either i mean like so to give you an example like thc like with the farm bill 2018 with thc being less than 0.3 percent i mean that was completely arbitrary right like there wasn't any like research or reason as far right. as i know um so sometimes they just kind of set those arbitrary standards and a just goes from there yeah <laughs> the spin of the wheel huh <laughs> yeah <laughs> um so we've seen that um cbd is used i guess on a, on a label primarily as a supplement right a supplemental facts mm -hmm. uh, and stuff right. like that but there is a cbd drug or a hemp drug with epidiolics mm -hmm. yeah when, when and how will i guess are are, are you guys seeing it's going to move from a supplement to a drug Ooh, I mean, like, even the term supplement is so complicated because technically, like, what a supplement does versus what a drug does, like, cannabis or CBD, like, you could put that in the drug category, which is how they've made it into that um, prescription medication. Um, so that's the CBD isolate that comes from the plant rather than being synthetic because a lot of the other, so there are other medications that come from cannabis, um, but those are THC based out. Those were approved in the eighties and nineties. And those are specifically for like nausea and vomiting associated with chemotherapy. Um, but those are um, synthetic. So it's like, it's a little bit different, I guess, where the origin is from. Okay. But I mean, it's, uh, I don't know if it will ever be a hundred percent just prescription. I don't know if it will be. I think that would be a lot more limiting for patients in terms of accessibility, um, which is not ideal at all, especially for patients who can really benefit from it. Right. Huh. I, I, I don't know. I, That's I really more of a political know. question than anything, you know? Oh yes, definitely. <laughs> Very dependent on the political schema. Yes. So mm -hmm. with that being said, what type of lobbying are you guys doing to push your agenda forward? 
there are some great organizations doing a lot of like good advocacy work. Um, I think to an extent, every single practitioner is involved in advocacy, even if it is like just for their patients, even if it's not like state or nationally. Um, but there are quite a few organizations that are doing really good things and that are like really trying to lobby for um, the medical use of cannabis. There's quite a divide right now on like whether it should be 100% legalized because that could pose some issues for certain populations or if it should be completely just for medical use it's it's highly contentious yeah right i think it's also a <laughs> yeah. tax question too because you know once it's legal and yes. decriminalized people are going to be growing in their backyard selling it on the street mm -hmm. just like they used to do so yeah mm -hmm. yeah and there's not the mm -hmm. same uh uh what's the word am i looking for not roadblocks um Anyways, the same <laughs> standards put in place yeah, to offer the customer, the patient, you know, that specifically, you know, it's kind of mm -hmm. like the rec market yeah. versus the, the med market and stuff. Like exactly. That. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so since the hemp space, the FDA, you know, is cracking down on a lot of the hemp companies saying you can't mm -hmm. diagnose, treat or cure. Very true. Mm -hmm. It's almost like putting the cart before the, uh, I wouldn't say that because you guys are doing the research. And so you guys can actually, you know, recommend that stuff. How can the FDA say that you can't do that when you guys have research to back it up? Um, because of the way it's regulated. So if, if the, like, for example, if like a diet, if they're calling it a dietary supplement in their formulation, just by the way it's regulated, it doesn't have the same standards as a prescription, as a prescription medication. And therefore they're not able to say that it can cure something or be spe for a specific diagnosis, but they can say that it helps with like brain health and it can help with relaxation and things like that because it's not that specific like curing type of claim. It's like a structure function claim, which is what it's called for that instead of the other one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I got to throw those, yeah. uh, you know, informatory questions out there every once in a yeah. while, you know, because the, the brand new Definitely. listeners coming in, you know, they don't know what it's used for, why they can't mm -hmm. diagnose, treat or cure, et cetera. So I'm glad that, yeah. you know, you could clear that up for all the listeners out there. So with new cannabinoids coming out, CBG, mm -hmm. CBN, CBC, right. so, how many cannabinoids have you guys found? Oh, so, so, so many. There's, <laughs> I mean, every time I read something different, it's quoting another higher number. So let's say like, definitely more than 200, probably a lot more than that. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. So which ones are showing more prom? Well, I guess since they are so new, and you guys have mm -hmm. so many to focus on, is right. there one in particular that you guys have your sights on? Mm, that's a good question. I mean, there are quite a few that have been making some headlines. There are quite a few that are coming out with more and more research that like when we're talking about like the ensemble effect or the entourage effect that it works very synergistically with another compound like CBN for sleep is supposed to be incredible, particularly when used with THC for sleep. Like that's a great example. Um, I know CBG, there's some really good research with um, like IBS and those like Crohn's disease and those sort of like GI or gastrointestinal issues um with the autoimmune so i, I there, there's just so much but um i think it's it's very promising and really really exciting honestly that there might be all those other options that come from the same plant so it's not just limited to the two major cannabinoids that we know about it's not limited to like just having ratios of the two of them um, and then, oh my gosh, so much research coming out with terpenes too, which I love <laughs> yeah. terpenes because they're, they're so incredible because, I mean, terpenes are in ca cannabis, of course, but I mean, they're in so many other things too. They're in like, I mean, like myrcene is in mangoes, like it's, it's in so many other things, linalol and lavender and like, there's so many other ways to look at terpenes. So I think that that might be something that's a bit more like accessible and easier to understand for someone who comes from like a Western side that like it is found in all these other things and it can have these therapeutic values in other things so if that same compound or like a very similar compound is found in cannabis potentially it could have um that type of therapeutic value so definitely so, i think terpenes have so much potential so you yeah. could so you, you could have like a one-to-one -one ratio and then you add a terpene that's not in that and it could be completely different than what it was i don't not like completely completely different but right. i think it could have like an additional therapeutic value it could change the therapeutic value it could be better for one disease state over another for example um but yeah i mean terpenes add like another level of personalization in that way 
Interesting. And it yeah. smells great. Of course. That was going to be my next question because uh, there's a lot of debate about terpenes and, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's indica sativa strain, whatever the different cannabinoid profile is. Mm -hmm. So right. for all the listeners out there that don't know what terpenes are, they probably think, mm -hmm. oh, it's just the smell. You know, they smell the lavender, they smell the mango. <laughs> what can you, in layman's terms, break it down for people to say, mm -hmm. start looking okay. at the terpenes? Um, so <laughs> let's think. So the way that I started learning about terpenes is actually through essential oils. So if you think about like the lavender essential oil, that is linalol, that terpene. That's what gives it that smell. That's what gives it that, well, we're not taste with essential oil, but that, that's what gives it its like essence, right? right? So um, a lot of the time it's called like, the terpenes are called like the essential oils of cannabis because it gives you that like same smell and feeling. Um, I've also heard it being called like the aromatherapy of cannabis if that helps um, kind of have that bridge between essential oils something that people might be a little more familiar with um yeah and then the, that works with a lot of other ones too like limonene that's in a lot of citrus fruits um and that one having that essential oil of lemon or grapefruit or bergamot or something and then uh, limonene also being present in certain cannabis strains at different percentages, um, and that helps lift mood. And right. yeah, it's, it's it's great for a lot of things. But. Yeah, I was gonna say because like whenever you're mm -hmm. like say you're out walking your dogs and you smell somebody barbecue and you're like, oh yeah. man, you know your mind starts going. You're like, man, I'm either hungry or I'm not. Or you think about you know your childhood or you know, oh, I mm -hmm. want to grill tonight. What do I have for dinner? You know, it starts mm -hmm. your mind racing, and it's uh, it's that's awesome. <laughs> smell is very underrated smell is really really important to i mean the entire like culinary experience of course but i think also to like healing i think it's very underrated so speaking of smell um mm -hmm. obviously everybody knows the smell of cannabis you can walk by and smell it you know and it's pretty distinguishable what it is mm -hmm. uh you know so outside of uh the terpenes and the actual mm -hmm. consumption of the cannabinoids are you guys doing research on the non-cannabinoid use of the plant like say juicing or from a dietary <laughs> standpoint um i don't know anyone personally doing it but i know that there is research going on right now i mean there's a lot of talk in the culinary community um about using cannabis and like infusing like it's therapeutic you know like benefits and everything within certain dishes having different ratios in different dishes um there are oh like if, if you're doing like a multi-course meal like having like the initial um like appetizer or something like that having a bit more of like one of the constituents and then ending like having a little bit more of thc for example and then ending with a bit more of cbd for relaxation so i, I th there's a lot of discussion with um with culinary which i think is really fun because I, I love to cook so it's always something i'm looking into yeah <laughs> do you have a favorite dish in general yeah Oh my gosh, I can't pick one. <laughs> I know, um, right? <laughs> just, I mean, I, 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 a favorite I love cuisine. Vietnamese food. Vietnamese, okay. definitely, is okay. my favorite, but. Oh, I, I don't know if I could pick one dish. <laughs> yeah, there was a uh, Vietnamese uh, pho and sandwich, or. Banh mi place. Yeah, banh mi. Yeah, banh mi. Yeah, they were right, right mm -hmm. down the the street from the from the store. So you could always mm -hmm. smell them every day walking to the store. Oh uh, yeah. Talking about that smell, that mindset. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite <laughs> countries I've ever been to, too. Definitely. Yeah. Oh yeah. What part did you mm -hmm. go to? Um, so I did a backpacking trip through Southeast Asia by myself a few years ago, in like 2016 now, wow. like a while ago. Um, and so I did Thailand, Vietnam, and Cambodia, but I just like kind of booked my flight in and out and didn't really plan like exactly the entire trip. And so I ended up spending most of my time in Vietnam. So I went to a lot of places and just kind of worked my way from Ho Chi Minh up to Hanoi. Wow. And I loved it. Yeah. It's beautiful. The food is amazing. The people are so nice. It's so nice. So yeah. in your travel, did you interact mm -hmm. with anybody uh, that is using cannabis, any doctors or anything like that? Oh, it was just a personal trip, actually. And I mean, the regulations in those countries are a lot more strict. Thailand, I know, like much more strict than the U.S. So I don't think that's something you'd be like smelling on the street, <laughs> on the average street. Anyway. Not downtown yeah. L.A. <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> so um, with the research out there with the plant, like say mm -hmm. juicing and from a nutritional standpoint. Right. Mm -hmm. um, because I'm a big believer in, you know, kind of 
educating people whenever they walk through the door of the store because that was the biggest mm-hmm. thing you know they're like i know nothing about it you know right. it's all brand new because this was all pre-farm but this is 2016 2017 mm-hmm. and yeah. so nobody knew anything about it i kind of mm-hmm. was just coming on to it you know reading books self-taught etc right mm-hmm. and so you know a lot of people were telling me a lot of people that were in the space you know before i came in you know the hemp farmers that went from cannabis to hemp uh mm-hmm. the researchers and the labs and stuff like that that really preached diet the diet is the mm-hmm. biggest thing in the whole yeah. holistic approach and so, so important yeah. yeah and so what mm-hmm. part of the diet would you say needs to be changed or should be looked at the most scrutinized whenever they want to start a regimen like this yeah definitely i mean so that goes into the entire category of what's called cannabimimetics so it's like other activities other foods other things that can impact your endocannabinoid system and its tone is what it's called so like its functionality overall um so i think that when people are talking about like diet and cannabis together they're talking about foods that could potentially interact with impact improve the like functionality of the endocannabinoid system um so a great example of that is like omega-3 fatty acids foods that are like very high in that um that could be like certain nuts like walnuts um but of course the more classic examples like fish um or like um the omega-3 fatty acids like a lot of people take supplements to um that like that's an option in terms of cannabimimetics even a part from food there are also other plants and other like foods and other things that could help impact and like work with or work on the endocannabinoid system um so like an herb for example echinacea which is very popularly used around this time for like um for prevention of flu um that has been shown to have activity at the cb2 receptor so one of the two main receptors in the system um that's mainly a associated with immune immune function or immune system um so that also could very much impact the way that your endocannabinoid system is working and if you're taking like exogenous and uh, cannabinoids like from the plant like phytocannabinoids then like that can also play a role too with the other herbs you're taking, which again, why it's so important that you have like a practitioner who knows a little more about that, who can help you. Cause if they see that you're taking echinacea on your uh, medication list, your natural products, natural medicines list, that could really help them too. Wow. I mean, I just learned something right there. Cause <laughs> so you're saying, I guess it makes sense because you know, the more you work out, your cardio gets better, your muscular system gets better. And so mm-hmm. the more you use your endocannabinoid system, you're saying your fitness level of your your fitness level of your endocannabinoid system will increase? Um, I don't know about using it necessarily. I don't know if I'd use that verb necessarily, but like just like being able to support it. Right. Like it's kind of like immune support, like being able to support the immune system. It's like a similar mentality to me that like that's like supporting your endocannabinoid system. And there are just so many ways to do that. A lot of people talk about like exercise. That's a huge one. Um, a lot of people talk about like the endorphin high. It's actually an anandamide high that's associated <laughs> with the endocannabinoid system. Endorphins are involved. They're just a bit like farther down the cascade. And that's like a whole like history lesson. But um, yeah, so but that like high or how great you feel after like anandamide was named after um, the Sanskrit word ananda, which is bliss. Like it's like that bliss feeling. Wow. Um, yeah. So, I mean, exercise is huge too. I mean, so many lifestyle things along with diet, just all impact your endocannabinoid system in a way that you probably are just unaware of. Yeah. Right. That whole holistic mm-hmm. approach, like what you're working on. Yeah. Diet, exactly. Exercise, exactly. sleep, mm-hmm. you know, just the proper self-maintenance, you know? Oh yes, being, definitely. Being There's a lot in, in the entrepreneurial space and, you know, mm-hmm. the, uh, you know, successful people space, if you will, you know, that alpha level, um Mm -hmm. they say mindset is something that or mindset and meditation and self-awareness is something that Mm -hmm. you know you should strive to do that you know successful people do and you say you're working on it and you talk about it all the time so for Mm -hmm. the listeners today how can meditation help them with their endocannabinoid system I mean, so meditation really helps support the endocannabinoid system. It helps increase endocannabinoid tone is what it's called. Um, And so it can really help how you feel overall, just because the endocannabinoid system is so like interlinked and interwoven with so many other organ systems and so many other systems in your body, that if that then if the endocannabinoid system is functioning well, then a lot of your other systems will kind of follow suit. Um, So, I mean, 
any type of meditation practice can be helpful. Some people find that meditating like two minutes every morning and two minutes every evening is highly beneficial for them. Um, and then some people say that they need like full weekends where they can devote to it if they go to like a retreat, wow. for example. And yeah. some people use that as like a reset almost. Um, that's another thing like with like personalized medicine that like everyone kind of responds to and reacts to and needs a different like amount of different things. And so I know some people who meditate every single day or they meditate every morning before starting their day and that really helps their mindset for the whole day. Some people end the day with that as like a reflection. It's, it's, it depends on what the person needs. Yeah. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So what system does the endocannabinoid so you said it interacts with pretty much every system mm -hmm. for if, so, so people that are just coming into hemp because of the farm bill and everything like that you know tinctures right. salves uh mm -hmm. capsules whatever mm -hmm. how can you explain to somebody what the endocannabinoid system is uh, you know cb1 receptor cb2 receptors i didn't know that there was any more can you i mean educate me as, the li as well as the listeners yeah, so in terms of receptors, there's a CB1 and CB2. Those are the most um, commonly discussed and everything. And those are the ones that are specifically in the endocannabinoid system. But there are also other receptors that cannabinoids, like whether those are the ones that are made inside your body, like endocannabinoids, or the phytocannabinoids from the plant, like THC and CBD and all the other great minor ones, um, they can also interact with other receptors that are parts of different systems. So it's not they're not technically cannabinoid receptors. They're not technically part of the endocannabinoid system, but gotcha. they're very much um, related to and linked to. And I think that's probably why so many systems are related because cannabinoids can like latch on to or function with other receptors, not just those two that are like the most popular, most popularly talked about anyway. <laughs> mm -hmm. So you've been doing some research with HIV and AIDS, correct? Am I wrong? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I, I'm able to spend time at a clinic there every week. I mean, not right now with COVID, but but normally, yes. Like I, I do um, have time to spend with uh, HIV patients on a team. Mm -hmm. And have you guys been doing research with cannabis and hemp with uh, HIV? We haven't been doing any research, no, but I would love to. I mean, there has been great research that... Um, is ongoing that has been published about using cannabis in HIV patients. Um, a lot of the, um, a lot of like the side effects, for example, um, like the nausea and vomiting, um, a lot of like the weight loss or is like medically called anorexia um, is um, also can be uh, cannabis can be a great option for that. Um, a lot of like mood instability too um, for different mood disorders. Um, very helpful. Interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's back up a little bit and go back to the, um, you mentioned the, the whole effort, um, the use of CBD and different supplements like omega threes. Mm -hmm. Um, right. There's a new one on the market that a lot of states are starting to push for legalization. We're talking about mushrooms. Mm -hmm. Have you guys yeah, been working? Yeah. Have you guys been working with mushrooms and cannabis or so how? Mushrooms, do you mean like medicinal mushrooms or do you mean like psilocybin? Uh, yeah, like the psychedelic psilocybin mushrooms. Like the psychedelics. Okay, no, um, by that I meant, you mean like the adaptogenic mushrooms or the medicinal mushrooms. Okay. Um, <laughs> so the, um, yeah, so with the psychedelic mushrooms, there's so much great, great stuff coming out right now. So many people like learning more about it. So many practitioners getting, practitioners getting more involved um, in that entire process. I don't know much about the relationship between cannabis and psilocybin and the way that they both work. If they can work in concert, I don't really know. Um, but um, I do think there's a lot of potential and a lot of people are really starting to look at other substances to help them and other like practitioners that know about them that can help them through that process. So how... I mean, I'm me personally. I've done shrooms in the past, right? We call them uh -huh. shrooms out there on the open market, yeah. if you will. <laughs> um, is it is it being legalized or pushed to be legalized because mostly of a recreational standpoint, so that people can do it openly and not have to worry about it, just like cannabis was, you know, uh -huh. ten years ago, twenty years ago? Or what is the main use do you see of the psilocybin going forward? 
So my impression is that it's actually being legalized for like the medical use. Okay. Um, a lot of the places that have like kind of decriminalized it, um, one of them being um, like some areas of the Bay Area, I'm pretty sure, um, areas of Oregon. There, there are a few places that have started kind of lifting the criminalization from it to do research and to start to use it for specific practitioners that have that like licensure, they have that certification to um, be involved in that process with their patients. So I do think that it's probably more on the medical side. Um, yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. That's what I think. <laughs> well, I'm, it's kind of, uh, I'm glad you said that because mm -hmm. it's really kind of how the cannabis movement got started because if we didn't have the medical program, we wouldn't have recreational. Very true. <laughs> and everybody yes. wants to research it because i mean recreationally everybody knew that it got you high and that was pretty much it you know mm -hmm. it helped you it helped you eat you know it helped you sleep it, you know but now particularly you know, as, yeah with the things you mentioned if it's like thc dominant help with like appetite um help with sleep that euphoric feeling definitely and then without the research we wouldn't have cbd today and right. i wouldn't have this podcast <laughs> yeah <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> Um, so with the holistic medicine um, being a large, um, I, I wouldn't say fad, I'm not trying to, you know, downplay what you guys are doing mm -hmm. at all, uh, at all. Uh, but uh, what's the word am I looking for? It's just um, like gain popularity. I think yeah, it's, it, like it's really more mainstream yeah. now, as opposed yeah, to going yeah. to your doctor. Um, mm -hmm. As younger, um, you know, aspiring doctors, practitioners like yourself, uh, want to get into the space and... Right they want to find a program tailored towards cannabis medicine or tailored towards, um, you know, specifically hemp or cannabinoid research. Mm -hmm. What avenue, because this is almost, uh, would you say it's like a specialized type of medicine, et cetera? Mm -hmm. Like, is, is that like what this is starting to become? I think it is. I think um, a lot of practitioners currently and like new practitioners are looking to specifically specialize in cannabis. But I also think like for, a pharmacist that's working in your like neighborhood Walgreens or CVS, they're also getting a lot of questions about cannabis. So some people are looking to, yes, specialize 100% and do that. But then other people are just looking for ways to answer questions from patients about CBD or about cannabis. So I think some people are just adding it to their practice as well. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's like it's multifaceted in that way. So I guess the better question is, when do you see cannabis and hemp being uh, normalized in Western medicine curriculum? Hopefully soon. I mean, so like, so like slowly but surely it is being added. Definitely, like I'm participating in a, um, a program or in the College of Pharmacy at UCSD. They have one of the, the first elective courses in a College of Pharmacy for medical cannabis and pharmacology, which is really exciting. So um, I'll be guest lecturing in a few weeks there by Zoom. Um, but no, that'll be really exciting. Talking about like the intersection of integrative medicine and cannabis and our practice and things like that. But um, I do think slowly but surely it's being added, even if it starts with like one or two lectures here and there, and then it goes to, you know, an elective course, and then right. it goes to like being part of the core curriculum. I think it'll be a full on process from beginning to end, but I, I, I do think we will get there. I really do. And I, I think a lot, of, a lot of people are starting to see that this is something that is definitely important to have in healthcare professional curriculum. So outside mm -hmm. of the medical field, Mm -hmm. uh, a large influence of the cannabis and hemp space is political. Mm -hmm. What yeah. do you think will happen, say, Trump gets reelected for cannabis? Mm. Personal <laughs> opinion. Personal opinion. Uh, nothing much. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know if much will change. If, if we don't have a, like, a change in power, so to speak, or a change like in the government, to that capacity, I, I don't know how much will change, honestly. I don't know. I and could it, be wrong. It, and it's good that, you know, it's it's mostly on a state level for the cannabis um, kind of, you know, programs. And so mm -hmm. with your, right. with, with, as your, as your research has evolved, are you mm -hmm. seeing, are you seeing a lot of research being done in one particular state outside of California? Um, there are certain universities that have really like taken to it and that have been doing research even for years, like um, Ole Miss in Mississippi. They've been doing incredible research for years. 
Um, but I think a lot of other, there are quite a few of other schools and other programs that have really taken to it. I don't know like any other ones, like off the top of my head, so to speak. I just know Ole Miss has been um, in the game for a really long time. So you mentioned the, in the holistic approach, uh, there was uh, something that really stuck out to me, sleep, mm -hmm. hi sleep hygiene. Yeah. Now, mm -hmm. Why did you use hygiene with the sleep? Oh, because there's so much when it get, when it like comes to sleep, like so much of the time, like I remember counseling many HIV patients, like, and them saying that they can't sleep, they can't fall asleep, they can't stay asleep. Um, but then asking them about their practices, like before they go to sleep. So gotcha. are they looking at their phone immediately before trying to go to bed? Um, are they drinking black tea at 11 p.m. after dinner <laughs> um like like things like that like like i there was one patient who was talking about how like his friend told him that like tea helps him sleep before he goes to bed so he started drinking tea but then i asked him what kind of tea and he said green tea um and so just even like like being able to talk about like okay so green tea has caffeine so it's not something like we're ideally trying to drink um, before we go to bed but maybe look into an herbal tea or a tea that does um that can help promote sleep or promote relaxation and calming, like chamomile, for example. So, um, so that's like a big thing. Um, I think also like having, there's a big thing about light um, and not having any light in your room and the darker it is, um, a lot of people say that's easier for them to fall asleep and to stay asleep. So that's another aspect. Um, yeah, there are so many, a lot of people, oh, also um, not eating too close to bed, not exercising too close to bed also, because that really can rile up your system. Yeah, I mean, it's there's so many things to sleep hygiene. Those are just a few. I was mm -hmm. curious because whenever you, whenever people hear hygiene, they think of, you know, washing themselves, taking a shower, brushing their teeth, you know, like the, mm -hmm. cleanly, the cleanliness aspect of it. I guess uh, hygiene in terms of like, taking care of yourself right mm -hmm. yeah i mean it's true because like not a lot of yeah. people really think about that kind of stuff they're like and okay, sleep it's... is so important for like rejuvenating for resetting for refreshing like so many things so if people sleep better so many other things can come into line i think like sleep hygiene to me is very important i think like if you're sleeping well or you really try to like have a good night's sleep or i mean everyone needs a different amount of sleep of course but if, if you feel like well rested so much more goes better your metabolism is better throughout the day you have a heightened mood generally so yeah lots of things <laughs> is there they say on average eight hours of sleep a night is that true it depends the person i know some people who sleep four to five hours and feel fantastic and right do really great work and they don't feel like they need more um but then i like used to live with like one of my previous roommates who used to sleep 10 hours a day and couldn't function without 10 hours so it depends a person it's right. hard to generalize but perhaps eight hours is like the average or the mean potentially yeah all right well we're uh we're getting ready to close up the the show and you know all of the the answers that were provided by dr swathi you know great mm -hmm. answers hope everybody learned something from the show this week um how can the listeners follow you and how can they get a hold of you you know if they have questions or yeah definitely so just um connect with me on linkedin i'm always i um, excited to answer questions, whether it's like regarding cannabis, integrative health, just let me know about that. Um, and then also please um, go to my website. I try to like keep it updated with articles that have come out or interviews or um, other things that are happening, other events that are coming up. Um, so that is drswathi.com. So D-O-C-T-O-R-S-W-A-T-H-I.com. And we'll put that down below in the description. Right, and we'll put your LinkedIn down below in the description. I just got to, yeah, Perfect. all that stuff. We'll put the LinkedIn profile, you know, your website, mm -hmm. um, probably advertise. Do you, you said you had a lecture coming up. Uh, are you on like a circuit for that or are you focused more on your research? Um, so the the lecture itself is only for the College of Pharmacy students. Okay. So it's not something I can publicize, unfortunately. However, I am doing a lecture with Elementa Women about homeopathy coming up in June. So that could be something. There aren't publicity materials yet, but I can send them to you when they're created. But that's next month. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, for all the listeners out there, uh, stay tuned for more. Thank you for your time. You, uh, oh, you know, don't want to take up too much more of your time. I'm sure you're a busy woman. <laughs> um, keep up the good work, you know, with the oh, CBD. Thank you. It's so nice to chat. It's so nice to connect. Uh, doctor, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Oh, you. yeah. Thank you so much for having me. It's been yeah. great.